welcome everyone to our third Nova Consumers Talk, which is one of the many activities organized by the Nova Consumer Lab under the master, masterful guidance of Professor Jorge Moraes Carvalho. If you don't know about the Nova Consumer Lab, you are served. Here is the link to see what, uh, we've, what we are doing uh, beside these talks. The topic of today is uh, personalized prices and we gave to this um, event uh, um, a little provo a title that is a bit provocative. Who is afraid of personalized prices? How this after Black Friday, I think. Maybe you have had some discomforting experiences. I, on my part, had. Uh, but um, uh, my role is only that of the moderator and I will be very moderate in uh, performing this task. So my main activity is going introducing our uh, speakers today. So we have Elisa Arruda, who will speak uh, first. She is uh, one of the investigators at the Nova Consumer Lab. And uh, the second speaker is going to be Dr. Uh, Do uh, Dr. Giuseppe Versace from the University of Siena. We uh, go a while uh, back. And then uh, we will have an exceptional commentator on this topic, Professor Frederick Zuverdin Borghesius, uh, who uh, is uh, um, among other, among many things, uh, he is uh, part of the iHub, which is uh, focused on security, privacy, um, um, and uh, the I stands for interdisciplinarity, which is something that is super important to uh, emphasize when we are uh, dealing with these kind of um, uh, issues. And uh, he is. Uh, probably right now the most uh, uh, prolific uh, author with regard to price personalization on this continent and uh, therefore we are extremely honored of having him with us today. So without further ado, Elisa, the floor is yours. First and foremost, thank everyone for attending our talk today. Thank you, Professor Fabrizio, for uh, introducing us. And I would also like to thank my fellow speakers today, Professor Giuseppe Versace and Professor Frederick Borghesius. So as Professor Fabrizio mentioned, uh, personalized prices is a very uh, trendy topic right now, especially because we just had Black Friday and we have Christmas shopping upcoming. So let's start by sharing our agenda today. First, we'll briefly cover what are personalized prices then we will look at their potential benefits and detriments, mainly from the consumer's point of view. Subsequently, we will touch on some data protection issues. As we argued, the enabling factor behind this commercial practice is personal data processing and profiling. Later on today, my fellow speaker, Professor Giuseppe, will delve into this with more depth. And lastly, we will look at how this has gained notoriety in the consumer law context as the Modernization Directive addresses the topic by adding a new information requirement to the legal framework. So without further ado, uh, we, we would like to start by talking about personal data processing. We argued that this is what enables modern day price personalization because of the possibility of processing massive amounts of personal data regarding consumers and their habits. If in the past, personalized prices were thought to be unattainable because it would be impractical due to the sheer effort necessary to ascertain each consumer's willingness to pay and act upon it, our reality has since drastically changed due to the digitalization of their daily lives. Thus, what was not feasible in the past, as it would be far too costly, can now be achieved relatively easily by employing technologies related to big data, big analytics, and behavioral predictions, consumer profiling, and so on and so on. Now, the question that we are faced with is, what are personalized prices? 
Thinking about a business that is developing a pricing strategy, a professional trader or seller typically considers several different factors, such as production and distribution costs, stock levels, competition, and a general assessment of how much their potential consumers are willing to pay. When the focus of this process lies in estimating a specific consumer or segment consumer's willingness to pay, bearing little or no relation to the costs, price discrimination occurs. It is relevant to say that this strategy is different than dynamic pricing, for instance, which in turn focuses on adjusting the price based on shifting market conditions, such as supply and demand. Personalized prices can be understood as a sort of price discrimination, which is a broader concept for, the, for which the literature describes three degrees. So the first one occurs when the trader or seller is able to identify precisely each consumer's willingness to pay and in its most radical form is thought to be unattainable. The second degree is also called versioning, takes place for example when a grocery store sells two different sized uh, bottles of shower gel. So the family size one is cheaper in comparison to the smaller bottle and the consumer is able to make the choice. Lastly, we have the third degree price personalization, price discrimination, sorry, which relies on observing certain characteristics that allow for the categorization of consumers into different groups and then assessing each group's willingness to pay. For instance, this can happen when a museum offers discounted entrance fees for the elderly or for students. We recognize that the first and the third degree bear greater potential for controversy because the second one allows the consumer somewhat, uh, some level of choice in the matter. To make these concepts more clear, we're going to present a, an example. So here we have an online language school. Have you thought about learning another language during quarantine? I certainly have. Our school costs don't vary much as the self-paced courses itself only need to be produced once to subsequently be distributed all over the world via the internet. Their access to their target consumer's data may have many sources. For example, a billing address, browser and device used to access their website, social media information, among others. There is even the possibility of purchasing data sets from third-party data brokers. In this scenario, if our school opts to individually estimate each consumer's willingness to pay, by means of granularly evaluating their personal characteristics, for example, their age, location, professional aspirations, we have first degree price discrimination. However, if it makes two versions of the course, very similar, but with one slight difference, for instance, one of them leads to a certificate and the other one doesn't, and the students have the option to enroll in whichever one they would like to, we have second degree or versioning. Lastly, if the school divides their audience into different groups according to their peculiarities, to subsequently assess each of these groups' reservation price or willingness to pay, we have third degree price discrimination. For example, single moms looking to increase their employability might be willing to pay more for the same course. Moving on to the pros and cons of price personalization. These are but two of them. We're not gonna touch on all of them because there are many, we're just gonna discuss two. For instance, there is the market expansion effect, and it happens when the consumer who would not purchase something at a certain uniform price because of their lower willingness to pay are now identified and can be offered a lower price. The seller who would not be able to offer all of its consumers this special price, as it could potentially mean losses. But since the individuals who would not complete the purchase otherwise are now singled out, these deals can be directed to them. However, there is another side to this coin. Consumers that are less sensitive to higher prices can be similarly identified and spotted. These potentially leads to the offering of more expensive fees, leaving these individuals worse off than they would be under a uniform pricing scheme due to the appropriation effect. Still thinking about the pros and cons of personalized prices, we recognize that this commercial practice has the potential to spark controversy. In this sense, we set out to gauge the consumer's thoughts about it. In the context of the Nova Consumer Lab, we carried out a survey in Portuguese among consumers primarily located in Portugal. 
This project was notably inspired by a number of other investigations. For instance, the Consumer Market Study on Online Market Segmentation, sponsored by the European Commission in 2018. Two studies carried out in the Netherlands by my fellow speaker today, Professor Brahesius and his partners. Uh, the results were published in 2019. And also the studies carried out by Professor Van Boom and others. The results are also published in 2020, actually. Our survey has yet to reach the proposed participation goal, but with more than 80% of it already accounted for, we can see reliable trends. The question that I brought to our talk today concerns the participants' opinion on whether personalized prices are fair or not. Most notably, the highest percentage of responses, namely 44% of them, as you can see in the pie graph in the slide, pointed towards our participants thinking it shouldn't be prohibited as long as the consumer is well informed about it. Moving on to the matter of data protection, as previously mentioned, we argued that the key enabling factor behind this pricing strategy is the collection and processing of consumers' personal data and their behaviors profiling. Thus, companies that wish to employ this commercial practice within the European Union or in relation to individuals located here must comply with European data protection law mainly consubstantiated in the General Data Protection Regulation. For the purpose at hand, again, the personalization of prices, we argued that the most likely appropriate lawfulness ground lies in the data subject's consent. In order for this consent to be valid, it must be freely given and informed, among other requirements. To be freely given may carry more than one level of meaning in itself. For instance, there must be a real choice without detriment to the data subject, should they wish to deny it. And also, it entails that consent should not be given in exchange for something, as it would not be free. On the other hand, consent must also be informed, meaning that before agreeing, the individual must know for what reason their data is being collected and processed. This can be particularly challenging for the purpose relevant here, because who would agree to the possibility of maybe being charged more based on their behavior profiling? However, in reality, we have empirically observed that a large number of consumers ordinarily check the I accept option related to privacy policies quite hastily in order to enjoy whatever lies next more quickly. As I had previously mentioned, my fellow speaker, Professor Giuseppe, will soon delve into this matter more deeply. Lastly, moving on to the last item in our agenda, we'll look at the issue of personalized prices from the perspective of European consumer law. First, it is necessary to highlight a few general takeaways from this legal branch that bear significance to the commercial practice. First, we notice that there is an effort towards assuring a high level of protection for the consumers. This is enshrined in Article 169 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. However, consumer protection is not a solitary goal by any means. The development of a competitive internal market is also a top of mind priority. Lastly, transparency is of the utmost importance for the effort of bridging the knowledge gap that exists, that usually exists, between consumers and the sellers. For instance, in cases decided a couple of years ago, the Court of Justice of the European Union stated that the consumer must be informed about the envisioned economic consequences of a contract before, it is, before being bound by this contract. This is especially relevant for price personalization, concurrently from the perspectives of data protection and consumer law. In this sense, the GDPR points towards the need to inform the data subjects about the possible outcome of profiling, as indicated by its recitals 60 and 63. And, as indicated by the jurisprudence of the Court of Justice, the outcome of being offered either a lower or higher price, depending on their estimated willingness to pay, also should be made clear to the consumer, as it is undeniably that it brings economic consequences to them. Still from the perspective of consumer law, I'd like to talk to you about Directive Number 2161 that was adopted last year and arguably brought the first explicit mention to personalized prices within the legal framework. It came as one of the results of the comprehensive fitness check carried out by the Commission in 2016 and 2017, and member states have until November 2021 to comply with its contents. 
This directive has been called by many different names, such as omnibus or modernization, as it brings new features to a number of other consumer law instruments. Namely, in the section of amendments to be added to the Consumer Rights Directive, it brings a new concise pre-contractual information requirement for distance and off-premises contracts. Its recital 45 sheds some light on the new provision. It points towards the reason behind it, which is to enable the consumer to take into account the potential risks brought by price personalization to their purchasing decisions. This also indicates an approach, an approach aimed towards increasing transparency, akin to both data protection and consumer law as we highlighted regarding the obligation of informing the individual about this commercial practice and its consequences. Wrapping up my participation today, my goal was to provide you with an overview of the subject in anticipation for my fellow speakers' contributions. Once again, thank you very much for attending and bearing with me. And if you would like to, please don't hesitate to contact either me or the Nova Consumer Lab uh, here you have our email addresses and also the Nova Consumer Labs website. And I will now give the floor to Giuseppe. Thank you very much, everyone. Giuseppe, go ahead. Okay. Let me share the screen. Did you see? Okay. So first, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Fabrizio and Professor Moraes Carvalho for inviting me to join this interesting talk. I'm very glad uh, really to share my ideas on this theme, but uh, I hope to um, have a discussion with you on that. So let's see what is my intervention about? My speech does not deal with the um, definition of price personalization and with the economic aspects. I'm trying to answer the provocative question that is the title of this uh, talk. Who is afraid of personalized prices? I want to give you soon the answer. Data protection institutions, for example, in some way, my speech can be considered concluded, but it's not important only who is afraid, but why they are afraid about. What, so why data protection institutions are concerned about price discrimination? As Elisa already uh, explained very well, uh, personal data processing enables price personalization. And we know that Frederick Borgesius was one of the earliest scholars to see the problem. But data protection um, aspects involved are many. For example, transparency duties, uh, uh, data minimization principle, or the data subjects rights on uh, the profiling and the automated decisions. So I try to um, select, to narrow down the scope of my intervention and uh, I decided to focus only on two aspects of data protection. The legal grounds for personal data processing in case of price personalization and more specifically the, um, the consent issue. So when the consent can be considered really freely given and which are the positions of data protection institutions. So let's start with the first point, with the possible legal grounds. Uh, all of you probably know that uh, the GDPR provides six different legal grounds for personal data processing, but uh, in this case, we can uh, choose just three of them because when the data controller uh, has a commercial purpose, we can say that in theory, let's say in, in theory, the legal grounds can be the data subject's consent, 
the necessity for the performance of a contract and the necessity for the data controller's legitimate interest. I said in theory because um, I'll show you that two of them probably do, don't uh, um, apply, uh, don't work very well with the price discrimination. In, indeed, when we talk about uh, the uh, legal basis of the contract and the legal basis of the data controller's legitimate interest, of course, these are the best options for the data controller uh, if he wants to uh, personalize prices because he, he can uh, do the practice without uh, asking the consent and without the risk of not obtaining the consent of the data subject. But uh, in taking into account the um, interpretation of this legal basis, interpretation by uh, the European Data Protection Board, uh, the, the former uh, working party uh, article 29 uh, of the directive uh, of the former directive we can say that these legal bases are not the most appropriate so the first conclusion that we can achieve and the, the majority of scholars have achieved uh, is that uh, the data subject cons data subjects consent is the most appropriate legal basis so what are, which are the, the specific warnings about the consent? If we consider that the uh, business wants to use the uh, price discrimination as a, a systematic business model and it needs the consent, the data subject consent, probably the, the most um, uh, smart uh, technique is to bundle, to tie the provision of his products to the provision of the consent. So the, the issue of conditionality uh, that Elisa already mentioned and the reply of the data protection is easy. In this case there is no free choice. We have no free choice because if there is a, a, a logic or of the take it or leave it, so the, the, the data subject can give the consent, otherwise it cannot access goods or services provided by um, the company, the, the, the consent in this case is not freely given. But let's see more deeply what we mean with what we mean with conditionality and in particular um, when in in, the, in which cases conditionality bring out uh, an invalid consent uh, i'd like to do uh, a brief uh, um, uh, historical um, view on this point because before gdpr in the directive uh, 95, uh, 46, sorry, um, there was not any specific provision on that. So there was uncertainty among national um, states and there probably there, was a, a, there were also different uh, um, positions of data um, protection authorities. With the GDPR, we have a specific provision of this point, that is the Article 7, Paragraph 4, which is a provision uh, very discussed uh, in the academia, and not, not only. And uh, uh, on this provision, there was uh, um, an activism of the data protection, of the European Data Protection Board, and of the European Data Protection Supervisor. Both bodies interpreted very strictly this provision. And let's see which are the, uh, the possible solutions to the conditionality. So to the case uh, where the consent is the condition to access goods or services provided by 
a company. I chose four possible solution, solutions. Uh, you can understand that uh, we can start from the most liberal to the most restrictive. So if we adopt a consumer protection approach, we can say that the consent is valid if the data controller deeply inform the data subject about the tying effect. But if we want to add something more, we can say that the consent is, is valid only if there is an alternative. But uh, the alternative choice can be, uh, um, can be split, can be split uh, in, con in consideration of the, of the perspective we have. We can say that there is an alternative if other market players offer those goods or those services without asking the data subject's consent. So in the case of price discrimination, we can say that if other market players provide the same products by fixing price, the consent is freely given. But the approach of the European Data Protection Board is not this one. The European Data Protection Board said that uh, the alternative must be given by the same data controller that have to, uh, to provide an alternative between fixed and personalized prices in this case. Uh, eventually, we can say that the consent is valid only if the refusal does not imply an economic detriment. So also the previous options are, are not good because there is any way a commercial transaction. This is the position of the European Data Protection Supervisor in some way, where uh, he said that uh, um, the data subject's rights cannot be object of a commercial transaction. So these are possible solutions and represent the, the warnings about the team, but they represent the warning from the data protection perspective. The problem of the concept conditionality probably is one of the issues that uh, best represent the interdisciplinary of the, of the point. We can ask ourselves if the consent conditionality is related only to the data subject self-determination or is related more to free and undiscriminatory, undiscriminatory access to the market. And another question can be, may price personalization be a stable business model? Because to be a stable, a systematic business model, probably we cannot accept that consent is freely given only in the last option, in the last solution that we, we saw before. I'd like to, um, to share these questions and if you like, um, I hope to have a discussion with you on these open questions because so far um, the data protection institutions uh, uh, said something, but probably the, 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 the final answer to these open questions uh, are not given. So thank you for your attention and um, you see my uh, email address and uh, I like to receive uh, your, uh, your points. Thank you. So, thank you, Giuseppe. Now, minimal moderation. Professor Borghesius, the floor is yours. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks to Jorge 
Elisa, Fabrizio, and Giuseppe for organizing um, and for the interesting talks. Um, I agree with um, pretty much everything what you said. Um, I'm um, super fascinated uh, that uh, you did the survey. Um, and later on, I would love to hear a bit more about that. Um, and I also largely agree with uh, um, um, analysis of uh, data protection law by Giuseppe. And a couple of themes that uh, you mentioned, and I'd like to make a few remarks. Um, yeah, about data protection law, let's start there. Um, I agree with your analysis. So, the, um, because personal data are being processed, there needs to be a legal basis, and consent is uh, the only reasonable legal basis there, and people would not give consent. Um, however, uh, as you know, we have not seen um, enforcement yet by data protection authorities on this point, and I have never ever seen a privacy notice yet in which a company says, we personalize pricing. And um, I wonder, so probably some companies are just ignoring the GDPR here, um, but it may also hint to the fact that um, it's actually not that common yet, price personalization. Um, I'm um, uh, eager to hear whether you have thoughts on that. Um, one reason that could explain why it's not that common yet is um, that it's actually pretty hard to um, really guess what somebody's willingness to pay is. It is hard for an e-commerce shop to guess um, what would be the maximum price that they would pay for a good because you have probably seen, uh, you've probably had the situation that, for instance, you buy a lawnmower or you buy a new winter jacket and because you've shopped online for two weeks, you see you see advertisements for uh, winter jackets while well, you just bought one. And with advertisements, you just think, oh, that is stupid. Apparently, uh, Google and Facebook are not so good at profiling yet. Um, but you're not, uh, you probably won't quit your Facebook for that. However, if e-commerce shops make a similar mistake, and show you a super expensive price and they wrongly guess that you would pay that, then you go to a competitor. So perhaps it's still too difficult for e-commerce shops to do it. Another possibility is that um, e-commerce shops do price discriminate, do personalize prices, but we can't see it because um, um, sometimes they send um, uh, discount coupons by email and that is very hard to research for us because even if uh, with a whole team of computer scientists if we in an automated way check all the prices on on the e-commerce shops we will not see what kind of coupons they have emailed to people later uh, something similar is in um, uh, supermarkets in holland uh, people have a personalized discount card here and um, I don't really see what the person, I see the total sometimes of the, what the person in front of me pays, but um, I don't see exactly uh, um, the discounts that she gets, et cetera. So even in a normal supermarket, I don't know what personalized discounts in the background uh, people get. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah. I, um, I wanted to point out that um, you're probably aware of that, but still I want to remind everybody that many economists, the more traditional economists, say that price discrimination is actually a good thing. And in short, the theory is that um, the welfare of society as a whole becomes bigger and um, a certain type of traditional economists think that that is the main goal, make welfare as a whole for society uh, bigger. Um, and um, then in most economic theories, as I understand it, the welfare mostly goes to sellers and uh, consumers as a group lose out. Um, some economists answer, well, you should solve that with tax. Still, I wanted to point out that not everybody agrees that personalized pricing is a bad thing. 
at least some economists disagree. Um, but probably in your survey, uh, you will probably find that uh, most of the general audience think uh, personalized pricing is horrible. Uh, that was pretty much also what we found in our survey. Um, and I have to add that, it, that most legal scholars, we didn't do a survey among legal scholars, but my, inter my casual observation suggests that lawyers generally find personalized pricing unfair. Then again, some types of price discrimination I actually like. I think it's completely fair if students get a discount. So apparently it is the personalized bit that um, worries us the most and not the fact that different people pay different prices. For instance, um, cheaper medicine prices in poorer countries is completely fair, I think. Um, but it's not so easy to theorize why people hate personalized pricing. I think one aspect is that on the internet it can be secretive, it can be hidden. While it is pretty clear that if you're in a coffee bar and the student enters and shows a student card and he or she gets a discount, that is open, clear, and also somewhat understandable because most students don't have much money. Um, Oh, and Giuseppe um, uh, highlighted the problems about when is consent freely given. I find that a super fascinating topic. And as Giuseppe highlighted, the, here consumer protection law and contract law and um, data protection law kind of interact. And I think there's much more research that can be done there because um, a few papers have tried to combine the two fields, but most data protection law scholars are not consumer protection specialists. And the other way around, many contract law specialists don't really understand all the details from data protection law. So I think we um, much many interesting papers and PhD thesis can be written about how these different fields interact. Um, I'll leave it at that. Well, no, I would love to hear a bit more um, of your preliminary survey results. It would also be fascinating if you find, for instance, different opinions than we found in Holland. Um, thank you again with the great presentations. So, thank, you. Um, thank you, everyone. I think um, yeah. before opening the floor, um, Elisa, perhaps react uh, specifically to this uh, point. So I would just like to talk a little bit more about our survey. Uh, we, of course, uh, were inspired by the surveys that I mentioned, uh, including the ones carried out by Professor Bahasius and his partners. Yeah, please call, all call me Frederick. Okay, <laughs> we'll do, we'll do. So nevertheless, uh, we aimed at people that uh, spoke Portuguese, not only here in Portugal, but we also left it open for other uh, Lusophone consumers elsewhere, even though our majority of respondents uh, said they were here. With the benefit of the modernization directive already in existence, one of our main goals was to investigate what is likely to be consumers' understanding and reaction when faced with disclosures pertaining to price personalization because they do not yet really exist, like Professor Frederick just pointed out. So we structured our questionnaire in sections, different sections. So we tried to see if people thought they were already presented with personalized prices or not. And the responses were pretty scattered. Let me see. Here. We have 25% of people saying they don't think they ever were presented with a personalized price. 32% said maybe, and 41% said they thought they were already presented with a personalized price. So it's all over the place. We don't have a clear majority for any of them, even though the highest uh, response rate was for the affirmative. And when we ask people uh, on how, how many of the transactions that occur online, what percentage of them uh, price personalization occurred, we ask this on a scale from one to seven. So the, the number four in this scale would be in some occasions, 
uh, we have 37% of people saying that in some occasions price personalization occurs online. So even though we don't have um, much evidence on, on actual price personalization occurring, people seem to think it does happen. And also about the different examples, we saw just like Professor Frederick mentioned, uh, supermarket loyalty cards. Uh, our respondents seem to think they're fair and okay because we have here a clear majority responding that it's absolutely fair and, and just. So we have 52.8% uh, of people responding in the fairness side of things. And also, for example, uh, discounts for elderly or for students are also here very well uh, thought of. We have 63% of people saying they're absolutely fair. On the other hand, when we ask people about a fast food restaurant inside an airport charging higher prices than another similar restaurant from the same from the same brand charging different prices cheaper ones outside of the airport a lot of people thought it was unfair so we have only 35 percent here saying that it was absolutely unfair but um, the majority of answers were concentrated on the unfair side of the scale these are just a few examples our our survey is quite extensive but it is interesting to see how people think about these things on, on different countries. And one other particular and particularly interesting example was about the supermarket loyalty cards. So here, people really love them in Portugal. They're very popular <laughs> and everybody thinks they're fair around here. I shared the link to our survey on the chat. So if it, anybody would like to, to answer, I also have the questions all translated into English. So if anybody would have, would like to have a look, I can also share the English version with you guys. Oh yes, please email that to me. Of course, we'll do. Thank you. No worries. What I do by the way, with every supermarket visit, because I, I don't like the privacy implications of the discount card. Every day I say again, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot my discount card. Can you, um, can you swipe one for me? And they always do at the cash register. <laughs> <laughs> they swipe their own, maybe. <laughs> yeah. So, so thank you. Thank you for the intervention so far. Um, we have, um, we have a question from, from the audience and, uh, please, uh, do not be shy in, uh, in asking questions because I have many that I want to ask and therefore I have an internal conflict between my role of moderator and the questions that I want to ask. So please help me behaving. All right. Please help me doing that. I also have an additional question, but first to others. Can I, can I say something? I'm yes. also in a, in a specific position here, but I have a, a question for all and I don't know. I have, um, I have a problem with price personalization and specifically, and Fabrizio knows it, uh, with personal, uh, personalized discounts. Uh, I think it is very important that if a discount is announced, um, there is really a reduction of the price. And my question is, if we have a price personalization for all consumers, um, what is the reference price? How can we find the reference price if, the, if there is not um, um, a price for, all, for a group of consumers? I don't know if, if you can understand the question. Mm -hmm. I might. Where can we find the reference price if, if I have a different price for each consumer? And why would you like to know the reference price? To know if it is really a discount. To know if oh, yeah. they are not announcing a discount in a situation where I do not have really a discount. And when I hear, when I, when I, when I see announced, yeah. I have a discount here. That's important because I see and I imagine that I will pay less than, I don't know who or, or when or where. 
but I need to have a reference if I'm going to choose to, to buy in that store um, and not in a different one or not in a different day um, or not via a different uh, way of contracting. Uh, but I'm not sure. I cannot be certain because uh, I don't know what is the regular price if I only have personalized prices. Yeah, a bit like airline tickets almost, eh? because there's no really a reference price in airline tickets, is there? Yes, yes. Elisa? So, um, I would like to share some thoughts on this question that Professor Georgi shared with us. Um, for instance, the Modernization Directive has brought a, a number of amendments to, to existing consumer law documents. One of them was to the Price Indication Directive. So the Modernization Directive brought a new rule on informing and announcing uh, price reductions. So now we have the, the, the need of a reference price, it has to be respected in order for this announcement of the reduction to be considered as transparent and, and uh, abiding by the, the, the legal requirements. So it's interesting because besides bringing the two new additions, the new requirement regarding personalized prices and also this change on the price indication directive, the modernization directive itself does not uh, have much on the sense of uh, the interplay of these two provisions. So we're left to speculate. And in cases where there is no uniform price, there is no, there is not one price that is not personalized. Like Professor George was saying, there are situations in which we can foresee that a seller only offers personalized prices if their pricing strategy is solely focused on price personalization. We're left to wonder what is going to be actually the reference price to see and to ascertain if an announced price reduction is or is not abiding by the new rules to be inserted to the price indication directive. So we could extrapolate and not really focus on the part of announcement because the term announcement carries with, within itself some level of public. It, an announcement is supposed to be made publicly, otherwise it would be just a, an information notice or something less broadly referred to. We could leave this out for, for instance, thinking about the, the interplay between these two provisions and we could think that, okay, so if a price reduction is informed, we have to see what is the reference price. In price personalization cases, this could, in a radical example, be taken as the lowest, absolute lowest personalized price that the trader has offered to any one consumer. But this would be very, very difficult to, to ascertain in reality because as Professor Frederick has mentioned, we don't have enough visibility in the digital world. We cannot see how much the, the seller is charging from another person. So this problematic is, is going to be very interesting to see in the future when the new provisions from the Modernization Directive are effectively uh, inserted in the new legal framework. So we have a um, question from Sebastian. Yeah, so maybe if I can uh, jump in, I'll turn off, I'll turn on my camera. Thank you very much everyone for your presentations. Uh, they were great. I wasn't expecting anything else. Uh, but my question, I know Frederick has said he never seen one uh, yet, but has any uh, of you ever bumped into um, an online price personalization tag in a website? And even if you haven't, how do you see under the Omnibus Directive these tags being deployed and how layered may the, the provision of information to consumers be? How much information should be on the first uh, screen that the consumer sees and how much we can inform them, you know, through linking information? And, uh, how do you see this happening? Thanks. Please. Um, thank you for your 
question. It is possible, of course, that uh, perhaps even the EU lawmaker was aiming for that, that companies are so afraid to disclose that they personalize prices that they won't do it. So perhaps what in this case, what is framed as a transparency rule is meant uh, uh, that it has the effect of a prohibition. Because um, uh, I recently said, uh, said in an interview well we all know that something like we all know that shops um, uh, play tricks on us with um, s uh, with messages like uh, only three left or um, and uh, the same al similar algorithms could be used for price discrimination and then i mentioned the dutch e-commerce shop um, was, i didn't really say that they were using price discrimination but like the week later i got or the, the, nay, the day after i got the emails from their main pr person like no 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 we're not doing that so shops are really afraid for consumer reactions if consumers think they personalize prices so perhaps the transparency requirement is basically meant as a ban or uh, or do you think differently i don't know i never spoke to the european commission about this idea So Sorry for the delay. I was trying to put the survey here, the transcript. Uh, yeah, the requirement from the modernization directive is very laconic. So we are discussing in a research capacity, in a research level, how are traders supposed to comply with it? But uh, as people tend to not really enjoy the prospect of being charged more, presumably, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out um, if before before moving to the next question can i just give a follow-up on this please so um the way the way i, I i've been thinking about about this information requirement and i think uh, uh, the information requirement should be understood in uh, the terms of uh, you having the right to know how much the price was personalized. In certain contexts, uh, it is still possible. So, so this is tricky from an EU law perspective because the directive uh, that has been amended is a full harmonization directive. So member states, so we need to torture EU law in order to make, uh, to make this provision meaning this. I think it is possible. I've been I've been building the argument for that, but if it is not, it is going to be um, very tricky. One of the things that is problematic about this claim is that this presupposes, as 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 George was saying, the right to be offered an unpersonalized price. And I think also that right can be constructed in a, in some uh, in in some ways. But. Um, when we when we talk about uh, personalized uh, prices, uh, I think what what is going to, what what should happen based on regarding what Sebast uh, Sebastian was saying is that you should you should be told both at the same time, and then if it is a personalized surcharge, it is still conceivable that people will uh, agree, especially if it is some uh, special type of good. Right, so it is uh, it is a subscription, a monthly a monthly donation to um, an NGO. Mm. Right, mm. so there is, and then and then once you do that, the duty to inform is going is going to be a real bite because people will have to tell you why they're asking you more. Right, so I think I think it is not easy to interpret the directive in this way because it was really poorly written in my opinion but that is the the directive the direction that um, we should go to and one one okay. second yeah Giuseppe please oh sorry no so I'd like to add just something uh, to share some uh, some other thoughts about the information duties because from the data protection perspective probably uh, it's very important to understand what we mean with the information about uh, the automated decision and about the uh, how algorithm algorithms work 
Uh, also, uh, referring to Professor George's uh, question, probably uh, if we if the consumer can understand which are his parameters, he can understand more his own average because the average is very difficult to to calculate. Then the problem is that uh, about algorithms, there is the the question, uh, the big issue of the commercial secrets because the, the other point is that uh, the disclaim cannot be. Uh, Compl complete so but this is another another point sorry Fabrizio for interrupting you oh come on I just I just wanted to say that that while many economists uh, most economists uh, use the pie argument uh, uh, that argument can be challenged on normative grounds from an economic perspective, which is something that I've been doing in my research and it always makes most economists very nervous when, when somebody who is not an economist tells them what they're supposed to know as economists. Um, but I mean, they, they do it with us all the time, so it, would, it should be good that occasionally we can reciprocate. Um, I would like to close with sharing the question that um, Paula has, has asked, which connects this topic with its obvious um, twin brother, namely how this is going to be connected with artificial intelligence, right? So the question is, we can have, thanks to artificial intelligence, uh, um, adjustments in real time and Paula would like to know whether this is going to be good or bad for consumers and good luck with answering these questions my dear speakers <laughs> hello if I can share some thoughts on this um, so from my perspective what really uh, enables this uh, the pro pricing strategy of, of adjusting the price to the individual's willingness to pay, that individual or that group willingness to pay, we must analyze their data. And it is humanly impossible to analyze these vast amounts of, of data points. So we need to employ artificial intelligence uh, techniques. Of course, uh, in itself, artificial intelligence is only but a tool. And the, the question if it's going to be either good or bad to the consumers depends on how this tool is yielded. So it's going to depend on how the artificial intelligence is employed. Uh, algorithms and, and other techniques to, to process this data and also to adjust the price in real time because as Giuseppe mentioned, uh, we need to also act upon this this knowledge if we don't have uh, a mechanism that is quick enough to adjust the price to each person or to each member of a certain group we are going to lose out on these on these transactions so of course we we need to see if the general logic behind the algorithm is uh, somewhat fair if it's not uh, based on a hidden bias for example because price discrimination can only go so far as not to enact uh, prohibited discrimination because there is a, a very fine line between uh, characteristics that are protected by law and which are not. So it's always going to depend on the general functioning of the algorithm because they are protected by trade secrets. They are not general public for a reason because they have a commercial value, but the general logic behind the algorithm should be disclosed because it is important to know on what grounds am I being differentiated from other people to, to receive a different price, because it can be based on, on a discriminatory relationship. So these are my thoughts on the issue. Giuseppe, Frederick. Um. Well, um, the, both dynamic pricing, but more personalized pricing, if it, ha if it will happen more often, it, um, 
uh, as personal individual, uh, me personally, I think it's quite a dystopian because um, uh, you remember if there's no if there's no pandemics and we have to buy uh, airplane tickets for conferences all the time, I tend to postpone and postpone and postpone that because even if it's my boss's money that I'm spending, I still find it stressful to find uh, uh, not the cheapest ticket basically. Um, and I try different meta search engines and then I think, oh, but perhaps one airline company is not in the meta search engine. And at some point I buy tickets and then I think that I probably should have searched longer and it takes me hours and it's not fun hours. It's really, I find it quite stress, stressful. And um, to me, it sounds like a nightmare if normal shopping is going to be like that too. Um, so, First, I know this is just personal intuition and not legal argumentation, but to me personally, it sounds pretty horrible as um, uh, if prices fluctuate all the time because um, I, uh, I like the idea of a fixed price. I know it is only invented 150 years ago, um, but um, as a consumer, you can just be much lazier. It's just our life is easier with fixed prices. Um, and so this is, I'm not sure whether this is a fairness argument. It's not really a discrimination argument either. Perhaps it's a type of a transaction cost argument or just um, uh, not being creeped out. But um, I would hate it if it uh, becomes more prevalent uh, fluctuating prices. So asking Paula, uh, I can just say that uh, I don't know if it's bad or good, but probably even if uh, um, artificial intelligence uh, can uh, lead us to the um, continuous price adjustments, to have a, a, a benchmark, it's always very important to have a comparison with fixed prices. Because otherwise, if we don't have any more uh, a benchmark uh, and also the alternative because we can uh, return again to the the problem of consent but if we don't have an alternative uh, in artificial intelligence can really uh, destroy uh, everything we know and uh, everything uh, about the the consumer choices and so it's only can the only thing that uh, I can say. All right, so um, our time is uh, up, and um, thank you, uh, thank you. I would like to thank again all of you for joining us, um, Professor George uh, Moraes Carvalho for creating this center. Um, our speakers for 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 their sharing their thoughts and i hope that uh, well elisa is here but i hope that we can have a pastel de nata some port or some chorizo with giuseppe and frederick at some point hopefully in 2021 but uh, more likely 2022 i fear me too I'd love to visit in a uh, real life in uh, three dimensions <laughs> Thank you for organizing. I had a great time. Super interesting. Can't Good. wait to read your final survey paper. Thank you. That will Thank be you. interesting. Thank you. A good it's very much based on yours, so you will not find uh, it particularly uh, innovative in terms of <laughs> questions, but uh, it will be interesting to compare. Uh, yes, them. indeed. Super interesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Good luck to Elisa dissertation. Thank you, thank you. She's defending it next week. Yeah, yeah. she said me. Ah, have fun, Elisa. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for and thank you, Frederick. It's really, it was really great to, to have you here. Thank you so much. Let's be in touch. <laughs> yes, let's be in touch. Thanks again for the invitation. Bye. Bye.